Hey guys, what's up? Time for Banco Gambit white pieces. So one of the most difficult or one one of the most annoying variations to face with white and to play against is Banco Gambit. Banco Gambit happens after d4, knight f6, c4, c5 and when you play d5 what happens when they play b5? It's called Volga Gambit or Banco Gambit and the main point by black is by sacrificing pawn on b5 and afterwards pawn on a6 because we just want to take it they just want to have an open b and a files and for those open files they just want to create some sort of counter attack on those files and uh, usually they have a very pleasant end games they have a very decent counter play and lots of compensation in a big number of lines Benko Gambit was massively applied by, for example, Gary Kasparov. Uh, Benko Gambit was massively used by uh, Topalov. Uh, even Carlsen occasionally does it. And all these guys once in a while play this Gambit just for fun or just because they enjoy sometimes a game with lots of opportunities compensation and pretty active counter chances by black so uh what are we what am i going to suggest you to play here with white to take on b5 of course and they all go with a6 that's the main line that's the thing that everybody would like to try out with and uh, of course that's a part of the banco gambit and now i don't want to show you anything else but a very positional approach and line that was used by Karpov in the past and some mainly positional guys. So in the following lecture, I won't insist uh, too much on the analysis. I'm going to show you like five or six games and based on this model games, trying to show you the main ideas and to actually get like a better uh, feeling about this position and how should you play this with white. So, while well, I was uh, in World Junior Championship as a Serbian team coach on Sardinia, uh, I was just preparing a girl to play this uh, B6. And I gotta be honest with you, after a while, I just analyzed B6 and I realized, hmm, this could be very interesting and very tempting with white pieces once in a while. So, let's go. First of all, a uh, psychological approach is good with B6 you don't want to go into the gambit so they're already kind of lost uh, and i mean psychologically lost and they already dislike your opening choice uh, those who always go for gambits they like to play for compensation and with the active pieces and here that's not a case so you just go with b6 second thing this b6 move has uh, lots of interesting positional ideas but a little bit more about these ideas once I start showing you this uh, this file. So after b6, they have three options. They can take by Quinn, which is the main line. They can go with e6 and with d6. Let's go with probably the least common of those three options. It's e6. It's not entirely that popular anymore, but it's not uh, a thing to be underestimated. Once again, they go with some sort of interesting possibility to get the center. How? Uh, if you take on e6, which would be a mistake, they would take by f-pawn, and all of a sudden, when they play d5, this reminds me in a position uh, like a Blumenfeld gambit with black pieces, with a great center for black and a great active uh, game uh, for black afterwards. And that's why we are not supposed to take on e6, but we just have to go with knight c3. They gotta take, that's why they play, you take by knight. And when you take by knight, you just read knight c7, so they have to take it. Uh, rook is hanging, they gotta play knight c6. So this was a four sequence of moves. I don't have to show you anything more than this. And it's relatively easy to learn this. Now you play knight f3. An idea of knight f3 is to play knight e5, to threaten mate on f7 and to pin this uh, knight and rook on a8. They have two options. Good players will play rook b8. 
But bad player, players will go with bishop e7. Why do I say bad players will go with this? Because they allow you to jump on e5, to threaten mate on f7, and at the same time to pin this knight and rook on a8. So when this happens, they go castles, you just take on c6. And now, uh, take a look at this one. This is especially important. You don't take on c6 because you definitely lack development so you swap off queens which is going to give you a preferable type of middle game that goes towards the end game so when they take by rook uh, you just play bishop d2 to oppose potential bishop f6 with a bishop c3 take a look at a sad pawn structure by black first of all he's got three pawn islands this is a healthy pawn island but these two pawn islands on a6 uh, and c6 and c5 those are weak ones and i don't want to explain you like things how to play chess here but definitely position like this looks at least uh, much better for white if not is completely winning for example give this position to carlson or kramnik they would say technically it should be winning so after bishop f6 e3 you don't care they cannot take here because you just play rook b1 and when they move bishop you have b7 with a fork and you win the game and that's why uh, they just have to go with um, uh, rook b8 you just go bishop a5 they get the pawn finally back you play rook b1 and you play bishop e2 i once again insist you'll play castle your rook from f1 will come to c1 and for the rest of the game whole focus will be on those three weaknesses and at the same time your passed pawn which is a great strength in your position this is why in the ninth move they gotta go with a rook b8 they simply have to get a pawn back on b6 they urgently have to unpin the rook and to prevent your knight e5 move you play e4 in order to get the center to play bishop c4 and do stuff like that and they go bishop e7 simply they don't have enough time to capture by rook or by queen on b6 because capturing by queen on b6 would lead to a very big problems after bishop c4 and if one has to play knight e8 this has to be a set position for black uh, from another point of view if they take by rook okay no big deal i'll just play bishop c4 and now you gotta uh, move your queen up and you just have to put it somewhere in the center let's say queen e7 in which case i play short castle and then your queen just blocks the bishop and they cannot easily complete their development once again because of this they just have to play bishop e7 so i really need to stop here and to see do you feel how they already after e6 have to be very precise in the order of moves and uh, where they actually have to go with e takes d5 straight away uh, knight takes d5 they have to do it of course knight c6 only move of course rook b8 only move not bishop e7 because of knight e5 and when they play rook b8 you just go e4 once again only move bishop e7 so they can easily oppose uh, our main idea and main move here and it's bishop c4 and mating threat on f7 they can oppose it with castle so when you play castle rook b6 bishop d2 i'd like to stop here a little bit once again and to force you to take a look at this position very clearly uh, we have only two pawn islands and a better development well they have one pawn island second pawn island and a third pawn island that already means a lot uh, for example, take a look at this one. I remember uh, preparing rook b2, bishop c3, rook b6, rook a d1. Uh, what I actually like about this position is full uh, mobilization of white pieces uh, and possibility to go with queen h5 and attack on the king's side. After d6 to play bishop e6 and black would be more than happy to uh as trade many pieces as possible uh, you just go queen h5 bishop e6 and here you have this and queen g4 take a look at this one there are there are x rays on the pawn on d6 and queen on d8 there is a there is an obvious attack against the pawn on e6 and by the way you threaten checkmate here you're just so much better so probably they would they shouldn't play bishop e6 but they also can play g6 as well because you just threaten mate they say oh man but i'm gonna oppose your bishop you say where are you going sweetheart 
What are you trying to do? If you take here, checkmate, baby. If you just take on C3, checkmates, baby, here. So just like you see, they can't easily cope with these monstrous bishops on C4 and C3. And that's why after bishop d2, if they play the knight before once again, your queen just goes into the attack. I found one game with a rook g6 where black uh, tried to be uh, or to look at less dangerous. For example, they want to play some d5 and bishop g4, trapping the queen on the spot, but you just have this knight e5. Knight e5 uh, chases this rook away with tempo, it cannot go anywhere. Uh, and by the way, along with attacking rook on g8, you also have like a great threat on f7 pawn, so white should be much better here. So after bishop d2, they gotta go d d6, bishop c3, and bishop e6. I need to explain you uh, basic concepts about this one. When they take on c4, queen c4, bishop f6, I found lots of games like this. But you know what? I once again have to uh, get back to basics and tell you, hey, you gotta be better here. They have a weakness here. They have second pawn island here. They have a third pawn island like this. Um, in normal circumstances, we always should feel a lot better uh, because simply uh, you just have two pawn islands. D file is yours. They have problems with uh, queen on d8. And they just have problems with the pawn on d6. Also, this rook on b6 doesn't um, appeal to me like anything that's special. So all things considered, if I have to give an assessment of this game, I'd say that maybe Engine would say what is slightly better. But in the long run, Black is the one who's going to suffer so bad if he wants to play this position. And that would be all about d6 line. Speaking of the d6, you just go knight c3, and here I want to give you an approach. How should you play when they play knight bd7 and uh, when they are just feel f uh, happy to capture pawn on b6 by knight? To me, it looks a little bit unnatural. It doesn't look that good. And knight on b6 definitely doesn't present anything that dangerous to us, and it's not a threat at all. So knight on b6 to me looks pretty stupid, let's put it that way. So you just go a4. The point of a4 is to go with a5 and to defend pawn on b6 forever. There are two types of possibilities. They got a capture by knight, but what if they play a5? I remember when I played Banco with black, I was always happy if I could go with a5 because those positions... Uh, reminded me on this typical Banco positions when, when the bishop goes on a6. But here it doesn't seem to be working. You just go, with, first of all, they don't have an open a file. Second thing, you have, uh, second thing, you have a4, bishop b5. So here when you play e4, g6, bishop b5, take a look at this one. They cannot even take that easy. And by the way, any queen b6, just get ready to face in a very lovely way with knight f3, uh, afterwards, castles, castles, and a very, very typical knight e2 followed by knight c4, bringing your knight under the queen side, chasing the queen away, and in general, just getting more and more space every single move. So white would be much better. So after bishop g7, knight f3, castles, castles, knight b6. This is what I told you. What is this knight doing on b6? Uh, it's not attacking a4, it's not attacking d5. Uh, okay, they might go with some e6 at some point, but even that one is difficult because in some other circumstances we can break in the center and create some uh, isolated pawns on a5 and c5. So, you go rookie one. Imagine your opponent who in this position, instead of going with bishop g4, which happened in this game, goes with e6. That doesn't bring him any kind of a joy here. First of all, I can play bishop c6, kicking this one away. But I also like bishop e6, d takes e6. And I can always go knight d2 and my knight controls the c4. And afterwards play a good game. But I can also go after the d5 pawn. And I'm, I'm forcing you to play d5. And once you play d5, I can play bishop c6. I can play knight e5. I can, I can take on uh, d5. After all, but uh, you once again have to understand that those two pawns are going to remain weak for the rest of the game. 
And that's why this guy went with the bishop g4, h3, you capture. And the only good thing about this position is that they have now easy control of the dark squares, mainly e5 and d4. Although everything else is a problem. Queen e2. Where is your typical Banco counterattack uh, related with open a file? It doesn't exist. So after rook b8, rook a2. I like this move because it gives you some bishop d2 or bishop g5 followed by b3 at some point but okay bishop d2 has to be idea if you want to go with that and then you'll play b3 and place your rook where you need it usually it's the e file and also you're just removing the rook from potentially dangerous diagonal so after queen c7 here you may go with the bishop g5 with tempo but apart from bishop g5, of course, that you can go with bishop d2, for example, to defend this knight and to afterwards go with b3. No matter what you do, your position looks absolutely satisfying and they just have lots of problems. I like bishop g5 because they can play e6 we just taken they have the weak pawns and if they play rook 8 after e8 now my monster bishop becomes even uh, more dangerous and more threatening. So here i'd say that white is like so much better and if instead of a5 they just go with knight b6 what are we going to do so after knight b6 we just go with a5 i like this simple space grabbing move that kicks the knight away with tempo and brings the knight back to uh, d7 also they cannot play any a5 followed by bishop a6 for the rest of the game we go with e4 and we go with f4 usually i'm not a big fan of f4 moves especially in these kings indian benoni banco type of games but here it does work because of a very specific plan that was used by tukmakov against judith polgar uh, like 40 years ago uh, in the Netherlands. So after bishop c4, castles knight f3, knight e8, castles knight c7, uh, black usually in some Benoni positions would like to jump like this. And after queen d3, he once again, actually this time she once again shows a great, um, you know, like filling for these positions. And you know what? You, you cannot even uh, consider this being a free pawn because eventually. You did Polgar would get a pawn back on a5. So that's why Tukmakov played bishop d2. You did play knight e4. Knight a4. Knight a4 is a good move because bishop on d2 keeps an eye on a5. And once you move the knight, it would like to jump here, but at the same time, it just defends the pawn on b2. And here I found two games. Engine, uh, two correspondence players, played rook b8, rook a2 e1, going for some e5 afterwards. Knight e4. I very much like when I put my king on h1 in similar kinds of situations because now my king is just looking good. b3 and now went for bishop c3. Once you manage to exchange the dark square bishop in opponent's camp, king becomes weak. King becomes vulnerable uh, at least and you have a great possibility to attack. In this correspondence game was queen c7 e5 breaking on e5 is usually final break in these positions queen g3 what i like it and after queen d8 he just went what what if queen a5 nothing just take on d6 play f5 sack this exchange and open up everything you now have threat of queen g6 when the king comes on g7 you take on e5 and uh, black would fall apart black went for a queen d8 and played e6 knight f6 and played f5 you, can, you can't imagine better position than this and what kind of a gambit by black and Banco gambit, Banco gambit this was by black. Nothing. So instead of rook b8, rook a7, you did Polgar played, knight e4, king h1. Once again, I insist on a great nature of this king on h1 and inability by black to do any counter attack. Uh, bishop c3. Once again, uh, white applies absolutely the same idea. Exchanging the dark square bishops gives white an easier break in the center coped with e5 queen c7 just stops e5 but only temporarily after rook a to e1 you he wanted to go with e5 and e5 knight e8 e6 and here when you did probably hope that she could defend her position white opened up the game with g4 captured an f5 and not only defended pawn on b2 by queen on b b6, but also went with the knight e3 afterwards f5 and absolutely killed.
Polgar in the rest of the game. So just like you see a very nice positional approach by White in these games. And finally, let me just show you how should we play if they play just normal move queen b6. We just go with knight c3, they go g6, and of course we build up a strong center. You now threaten to play e5, so they have to go with d6. You now go, go with knight f3, and I insist on a very, very important thing, uh, not only here, but in the whole d4 concepts and openings. Knight on f3 usually goes back on d2, goes on c4, and it especially works against Banco Gambit with b6 because the queen stands unhappily placed on b6, so you just want to drag your knight to c4 eventually and chase this queen away. Uh, Bishop g7 is the only move, but a logical thing would be, hey Maya, if you want to play knight e2, knight c4, I want to prevent that. You can't play this. Maybe I can't play this like like that, but I'm going to play queen a4. If you move the knight, uh, I'll, if you move the knight, I'll play knight e2, followed by knight c4. And you would say, okay, fine, but what if bishop d7? Nothing. Now I improve position of my queen, and it doesn't go any longer on d1 but it goes on c2, and once again, my knight naturally goes on c4. So after castles, knight c4, and you always go with this a4, not only to stop bishop b5, but in some circumstances to maybe even play a5, knight b6. Just like in Tukmakov you did Polgar game. Knight g4, h3, knight e5. This reminds me on some Benoni positions where a golden rule by white players in Bet against Benoni should be don't exchange pieces so much because the more space they have the easier game they should have for their pieces mm, because they have a, a more a maneuvering possibilities uh, although after f4 kicking the knight away capturing by bishop going with castles king goes uh, in a safety king h1 and bishop goes on d2 all you want to do let me play b3 so i can make your uh, rook looking very stupid on the b file and second thing i would like to bring my rook to e1 and to eventually somehow break with e5 once i do e5 i'm on halfway to heaven so after knight f3 bishop g7 so not bishop g4 because of queen a4 don't forget about that knight e2 it's like a traditional concept here and one of the most important and most likable plans by white white players in d4 openings this knight, d, knight f3 knight e2 knight c4 it happens in some king's indian games almost always against benoni and just like you see and this positions against Banco Gambit. After castles, knight c4, queen c7, bishop e2, knight b7, bishop f4. What's so special about bishop e2? Why not bishop on d3? Because once you want to bring your bishop on f4, you don't want to give them knight h5. That's very important. Why else? You don't want to give them knight g4, knight e5 in some other circumstances with the knight bd7. So all these things, that's why you play bishop e2. And why bishop f4? Because it's now protected by the bishop on e2. They can't play knight g4, knight e5 any longer. And eventually you'd like to break with e5. I'll show you one game where black went for rook b8. Castles knight b6. Do you remember my words? Reminds me of Benoni. In Benoni, black is happy to exchange pieces. Are we supposed to do that? No. We don't want to give them space. So knight e3. Knight e8, queen d2, e5. Aha! You play some sort of like King's Indian. Let me just go with bishop g3. And here, f5 looks extremely dangerous, but only at first glance and if you don't have any experience with the d4 openings. So what is it all about? You always take. They always take by pawn threatening fork. And you always play f4. And here, f4 comes even better because knight is on e3 and it's the best blocking piece and it's going uh, perfectly fine against the pawn on e4 and this passed pawn on e4 is no longer a strong pawn so bishop f2 queen f7 rook a b1 and uh, one of the most classic approaches in these d4 openings boom then you break with b4 
that's one approach in these positions and uh, i i very much like it and i believe uh, ever since i analyzed all those carp of games i really enjoyed these b4 ideas rugby one followed by b4 with a rugby one you avoid diagonal and the activity by the bishop on g7 and you also want to play uh, b takes c5 rook f c1 and everything is just good the guy played 97 looks like he's holding everything knight a4 you're just provoking him to take bishop d4 b takes bishop b takes d takes bishop c4 threatening some nasty d6 ideas bishop b7 if uh, d6 knight d5 uh, bishop e3 and knight e6 or whatever so he went for d6 knight e6 and he absolutely didn't expect next move it's knight g4 threatens fork and the thing is when he captured played bishop d4 followed by f5 and demolished black so you go all the time very positional and all of a sudden you just from a nice positional game after you do rook b1 b4 and typical breaks in the center just go very tactical uh, finally instead of rook b8 let me show you a game of karpov where his opponent went with a knight b6 of course once again i insist they would like to swap off knights they would like to trade pieces if they trade pieces they just have more space to breathe and they will have an easier game so we don't want to give them that possibility so what are we going to do we of course play knight to e3 and now they can play uh, knight f to d7 and stuff like that i remember Chernin, coach of Kasparov, so I'll show you uh, Karp of Belotti game, but look at the game of Chernin. His opponent wants to play bishop a6 and to play similar position to a typical Banco Gambit. Castles, bishop a6, bishop a6, queen e2 attacking with tempo, putting it on e-file, h3, so not to give him any knight h5 uh, because of a great shelter on h2. And the thing is, after like a4, rook a c1, wants to use an x raise against the queen with some b4 ideas so in in case of a3 he probably would go with b4 so after queen a7 queen c2 queen a6 knight b1 what i like about this maneuver with the knight d1 and here this knight eventually is gonna come, go on c4 and it is not only going to go after the passed pawn on c5 but it's also going to defend this potentially weak pawn on c4 so after this rook b1 king f8 a3 f4 knight c4 went with the bishop f6 and absolutely broke black's defense and this is how grandmaster chernian won the game i very much like it and uh, he won this game in just few moves i'm just going to be a little bit faster and show you like uh how easily he killed his opponent and finally after 93 because uh, karpov's opponent belotti went with knight f to d7 he'd like to jump with the knight on e5 karpov played rook c1 once again using some x-rays against the queen a5 not only to play bishop a6 but at the same time to stop some b4 ideas a4 fixing and actually getting full control of the b5 square and i always admire to karpov's fantastic um positional uh you know like understanding so he went with this guy went with the knight b8 wants to open up the light square bishop and go with the knight on b4 improve its position a little bit knight b5 queen d8 played b3 and absolutely showed like meaningless of the knight on b6 i don't like this knight i find it very stupid knight a6 castles knight before queen d2 bishop a6 and rook f to d1 this is true slowly he keeps on improving his pieces and wants to eventually break either on the king side by launching some sort of attack or maybe breaking in the center with some e5 if that may happen so after knight d7 f3 knight f6 bishop c4 knight d8 rook e1 he now switches his uh, going with a different plan knight c7 the guy wants to exchange but karpov says yes i'd like to exchange but i'll leave you with a stupid knight on c7 and if you like to exchange let's exchange the bishops and i'll bring my knight to a better c4 square the guy played queen d7 king in safety bishop h6 and went with the knight g4 here we all can see that Karpov is getting slowly but surely ready for the final attack on the king side. Captured by knight on c4, playing bishop e3. And I already told you, uh, when the 
when you manage to exchange the dark square bishops you did like half of the job uh, in these openings why uh, because now dark squares are just weak which means that a king on g8 looks weak so after rook to e3 knight f6 knight f2 rook c on e1 f4 breaking on e with e5 improving his final uh, and preparing his final break with e5 knight h3 to defend on f4 queen e2 rook on f3 and th this this was Karpov's biggest strength his maneuvering skills and fantastic patience he would never uh, push pawns for two squares if he can push it for one and slowly uh, improve his position he played g3 played king g2 typical Karpov keeps on improving his pieces and then he fi finally broke with f5 the game ended up in just uh, six moves after f6 captured played rook f5 went with a rook f1 broke with e5 took by rook and by the way you can't take the rook because of queen e4 and it's uh, almost mate so if king g5 h4 is mate so after rook a7 karpov played d6 and crushed belati i hope that this lecture is going to help you in beating up bango gambit in a positional ways also um i i didn't try to give you too many you know like uh, tactical ideas analysis i was more insisting on uh, typical plans and ideas and how should you understand these positions better rather than teaching you like concrete stuff and playing 26th move here playing the 17th move there so hopefully you enjoyed in this approach and i'm pretty sure you're gonna have lots of nice results and success with it thanks for watching and see you next time bye bye